appeal, uh, Michael Ken will, will also be able to introduce himself in a bit more detail. Um, okay, if any questions, just pop it to the chat room. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me? I, I think, can you be a bit louder? Okay, can you hear me? Yeah? Is that okay? Can, uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah? Okay. Good. Let me just share my screen here if I can. So everyone should see the, the slides. Yeah? Good. Yes. Good. Thank you. Right. As Elaine said, if anyone has questions, please write your questions into the chat. I will try and be as clear as I can through the talk, but obviously um, if English isn't your first language, uh, I can clarify anything afterwards. So today I want to talk about extended reality, uh, a bit about what its applications are, what, how it affects us, how it's important in the future, and also how it relates to what we do at Aberté University. So welcome everyone to this uh, virtual open day talk. Very glad to have you all here. Um, I've already mentioned this. The purpose of this talk is to talk about a topic that hopefully you'll find interesting and then to talk about Aberté a little as well and what the courses are that we offer and why you should come to Aberty. So a little introduction to myself. Uh, my role at Aberty, I've been here now for 15 years, so I've been here for a long time. I've taught and I teach on the computer games courses, the technical courses. And although my research, but we'll talk about my research in a moment, I teach uh, computer graphics and computer games engineering and game engines and all these related topics, the technical side of the games courses. And research wise, I'm interested in making virtual reality better. I'm interested in making new types of augmented reality with new ways of creating augmented reality content. And most recently, we're interested in virtual production which is the pipelines, technology, and techniques to create um, virtual filmmaking. So to make filmmaking easier, to make filmmaking better and cheaper. And we've had some past projects in that. We did a project with 20th Century Fox in 2012, and we have two virtual production projects currently ongoing. And, uh, Hang on a minute. I'm just going to try and mute some people because I can hear microphone noise. Can you, if you're not participating just now, can you make sure your microphone is muted? I'll just go through and do it. Um, I can still hear a lot of noise. Uh, hang on a minute, I need to... There we go, everyone's muted now. Good. Um, so, what do I mean by extended reality? Um, well, it covers a broad range of techniques and um, second here. We're essentially, we're talking about using real time graphics in some way, shape or form um, in order to replace or supplant some of the perceptions that we normally have uh, of our everyday lives. 
So this covers virtual reality, augmented reality, and also virtual production as well. But what do I mean when I talk about being able to replace your perceptions? Well, our normal model for perceiving the world represented here, our normal reality, where we perceive information through our senses about how the world works. And if we want to change that, then there's a few interesting ways that we can change it. Augmented reality overlaps normal reality somewhat, where we are simply replacing or imposing virtual elements onto the real world. We can't replace everything and we still have an anchor into the real world. So we can normally still see most of the real world when we're using augmented reality. The next approach is um, virtual reality in the sense that we are completely almost replacing the real world in this uh, sense. So our visual perception of the world is completely replaced and we only have a very small anchor to the real world because we still have to move and deal with the physical space that we're operating in. Virtual production has a little overlap with the real world as well, but instead of replacing the real world, we also want to have an effect on the real world as well. And I'll explain that in more detail as we go through the talk. So by our perception of the real world, we mean our senses. And we have, people think that we, we normally have five senses, the basic five senses are sight, sound, touch, taste, and smell. But we actually have more senses than this. An easy way to prove this is that if you want to do an experiment, if you close your eyes and if you put your hand to the side and you can touch your finger to your nose, what sense did you use to do that? Because your eyes are closed, you can't see, yet somehow you were still able to do that. And that is the first sense, the proprioceptive body awareness sense. So these things are very important and there's many of them. We have vestibular sense, the sense of touch, which actually covers different types of touch sensations, quite complicated. We have thermoception, which is our ability to perceive heat and cold, uh, the perception of pain, air pressure. There's actually many, many senses. We can't apply all of these to the disciplines we want, but they're still worth knowing about. In virtual reality, we have a headset and controllers, and we use these to create a completely virtual environment. And it's quite cheap and effective in today's uh, climate. The headsets are readily available. They're not overly expensive. And we render an interactive environment in real time. And the senses we are engaging are the visual and audio senses. And all, the visual is the most important sense for our brains. It's about 70% of our uh, sensory perception is devoted to visual processing. Sound also is very important. And right now, we have a lot of virtual reality games. The best games at the moment are games where the proprioceptive sense matches what you're doing in the game. So games where you're doing some kind of shooting mechanic or you're sitting down driving or flying an airplane, these type of things. The body matches what the brain sees. These all, always do quite well. The problem with virtual reality is that there is not a killer virtual reality application right now. There's not a game or an experience that has made everyone rush out and everyone has to buy this and everyone has to use it. So not yet, we're still waiting on that. And there has been some cool games released this year. We had Half-Life Alex, which was probably the highest production value, highest quality virtual reality game produced to date. However, despite its strengths, it still relies on 
um, stereotypes of a horror and uh, sort of being scared. And these are very kind of easy targets in virtual reality, but progress is being made in the field. We then have augmented reality. And what we're producing here is computer generated visual layers to add to the world. In addition to what we normally see to give information or instruction or to add some decorative element to the world. An example here is products like Microsoft HoloLens, which is affordable technically, but it's still expensive. And these devices currently lack subtlety. They're still very large, they're still very obvious, uh, and it wouldn't be normal for someone to wear them in an everyday setting or something like that. It's, it's still technology is not quite quite there yet and again we're only able to supplant two senses with this it's just visual and audio we can add and it's not focused on realism these things are not trying to be realistic quality is getting better but it's not there yet and again we don't have a killer application for augmented reality yet an entertainment product but Augmented reality has found a tremendous market in serious applications. So there is a tremendous uptake of augmented reality in industry for training, hazardous environments. These are um, huge growth areas for augmented reality application. We also have virtual production and Virtual production isn't a new concept. In fact, we have been involved in virtual production since 2010, but it has really taken off in the past year, 2019, 2019 to 2020, we've seen a huge uptake. And virtual production is a technique of taking games technology and virtual reality tracking technology to create a highly realistic virtual stage which can be used to create an artificial background for filmmaking. So the idea being that you place actors in this virtual stage and film them and it looks like you're on a location whereas in fact you're not. The advantages to this are we can make changes to that environment very easily and you don't need to travel anywhere to complete this filming. So there's an element of being able to reduce costs as well as giving creative flexibility. So all of a sudden, the film industry is very excited about this and we're seeing these type of facilities pop up over the world. And it's very fast moving and it's using the very latest in video game technology. And it is very, very expensive hardware required. So you can see here an example from one of the latest productions to use this technology. And you can see the virtual stage behind the actor there as a, a giant video wall with a roof. But when shot from the camera's perspective, it looks like it's real. So very interesting, very expensive. This facility used in this picture cost about $80 million to make, but it's used for about 50% of the shots in this show are all shot on this stage. So all of these techniques fall under the umbrella of extended reality. We're making a change to some part of how we perceive the world technologically. Each of these stages is reliant on games technology in a major way. So particularly to do with graphics, rendering, what are the fundamental principles of that, how do we apply it, other concepts such as physics, mathematics, special effects and AI are also used. We also have to deal with hardware input, how the user actually deals with what they're perceiving and then also the interaction design. What are people going to be doing and when and why and how is that going to be entertaining? So these are all game disciplines. These are all core tenets of game development. 
that are all applied in all of these extended reality disciplines. So in augmented reality, we have somewhat basic visuals and we're limited by hardware at the moment, but it's supported by games technology like game engines. We have virtual reality, which is beginning to approach photorealism and it is extensively supported by game engines and games technology. At the very high end, we have virtual production, which is photorealistic. It has to be so it can be believable for making films. And the only reason this exists is because of the power of game engine technology and game techniques. So this is incredibly reliant on this. But is there an ultimate experience that we can make for the user? Is there a way to engage all our senses at one time? And there is. It has existed for a long time. I would define it as what could be called constructed reality. And it uses technology of a different sort. And some of you will already have experienced this ultimate virtual experience, this constructed reality. If you've ever been to a theme park, if you've ever been fortunate to go to Disneyland, Disneyland Shanghai perhaps, this is constructed reality, the ultimate artificial experience. Every aspect of the real world is constructed and engineered to replicate or make believable something for our senses. Immersion is perfect because it overlaps entirely with normal reality. So you cannot be more immersed, it's impossible. Disney and all these theme parks don't need to use virtual reality because they have the resources, they have the money, the time and the space to actually physically create reality. And they can engage much more of our senses than the simple five senses that we have uh, and the two senses we use in virtual reality. You can see, smell, hear, touch, be aware of, be part of the experience in a very, very interesting and compelling way. And there's a lot we can learn from theme parks because although our technology is different, they have been solving the problems of constructed reality for, for 70 years now. So we can learn lessons from what they do to design an experience that someone will have, that they move through a space that when you want to draw people's attention, you, if you want to tell them a story with a space, theme parks have been doing that for a very long time. So there are differences and limitations and what we can do, but we can learn a lot from theme parks. And although we have different ways of controlling and giving perception, it's a very interesting area to look at. And now, if you've been very lucky to go to some of the Disney theme parks recently, there are new Star Wars themed attractions. And one in particular is now using video games technology. So what we have now is video games bleeding over into the theme park industry as well, where an element of a ride is being produced entirely in real time, courtesy of a modern games engine. So to summarize, we have this world, we have extended reality and beyond, virtual reality, augmented reality, virtual production, and even real time theme park attractions and parts of developing feature films and video game technology permeates through all of these areas. We're, we're at a stage where it's actually dependent on them. Cutting edge game technology has become so powerful that it's giving people across all these disciplines outside of video games, tremendous power, tremendous flexibility and the ability to create things that they would never otherwise been able to do. And using these techniques and these technologies is what art programs are about. 
our programs cater from the highly technological aspects of it to the use of the technology in creative aspects of the pipeline. And just to talk about our school, uh, that slide's actually so wrong, the school name's wrong. Uh, so Aberty and the Forget AMG is now the School of Design and Informatics. We work with and build links with local and international partners. We work with companies. We're working with Epic that make the Unreal Engine. We're working with uh, games companies that we would have heard of. Some of our courses are, we work with Blizzard Entertainment to create some of our modular content. We want to give our students the information they need, the tools they need to be able to work in this industry but also we want to give them an experience that mimics the industry that they're about to go into as well so that when our students graduate they don't just have the knowledge they have the experience to be able to apply themselves in that industry as a valuable member of a team we also have a very good culture of openness and independence we want to work between our disciplines from the creative to the technical and try to be a force for positive change in academic and industrial communities. So we're not only interested in our own selves, we're trying to positively affect the industry as a whole. And our programs, I want to mention them all in turn. Uh, we start with a very technical from te computer games technology being the most technical, computer games application, game design, and production and computer arts in order of most technical to most artistic. And these are our undergraduate courses. And I am actually a graduate from computer games technology from one of the first graduating years of that. And at the master's level, we have an MSc in computer te games technology, which is designed as a course you would undertake if you were coming from an existing program a technical degree in programming or some such and wanted to learn the game side of it. And we also have the MPROF in games development, which is designed to provide even more professional experience. And it's a degree that is based primarily on teamwork, team building and communication on short games based projects. So hopefully that was interesting to you guys. I didn't take too long. It's not a particularly long talk. Uh, I'll leave this slide up for the moment. Uh, if any of you want to follow us or contact us, these are the links to how you would do that. And what I'll do now is I'll stop screen sharing in just 30 seconds. So if you need this information, get your phone out and use the, use the tags just now or please note it down and I will then be able to look at the chat again and hopefully answer any questions that you have and I'll unmute everyone as well but please if you do have a question the best way to do to ask the question is to write it in chat I can't see the chat just now but I will go through it as soon as I have um, stopped sharing my screen so I can see the chat again okay right I will stop sharing now back to back to reality okay so let me just uh, i should be able to i muted people but if you can if elaine and janice if you want to unmute yourselves and um, you can help answer any questions let me just look through the chat here Oh, sorry, Elaine, I couldn't let anyone in. I didn't realize. Um, and when I'm screen sharing, I can't see that part of the system. Um, the problem, uh, looking at the first question here, what kind of features should a, a killer app have? Let me just... And how do I let people in, first of all? That's probably a good question. I 
can't see anybody waiting to get in anymore. And yeah, so what features should a killer app have? Um, I think that's the problem is that we don't know what features a killer app needs in order to be um, successful. With things like uh, virtual reality, we still do not know what the vocabulary of the creative process is going to be. So if you look at something like filmmaking, filmmaking is has a very understood vocabulary of how films are made, what the language for communication is. We can use the camera in a certain way. We can create lighting in a certain way. We can do camera cuts. And there's a, there's a, there's a language of filmmaking we have not yet discovered and developed the language for virtual reality or augmented reality yet. So people are still discovering new things. So we have not yet discovered what would make a, a sort of the killer app, as you say. A lot of it as well as to do with technology that it is not yet commonplace or commonly acceptable to be wearing a VR headset in a lot of situations to be engaging in a virtual experience uh, in the home. So that is not commonplace uh, yet either. And many people do not have the space to facilitate that in their home. So th there's a few factors there as well. Uh, a minute. Yeah. Sorry, I'm still dealing with this uh, thing here. Matt, there was a yeah. question earlier when you talked about the 18 million uh, scene. Um, there was a question asking, uh, was, yes. that, was that 80 million just for one scene? No, no, that is 80 million for that studio environment. So that studio, that building has uh, a large video wall screen, which is uh, 70 feet in diameter with a video wall roof. Um, that is entirely geared towards that. So that facility cost 80 million. So very expensive. And I think the budget for that show, I think it's 50 million an episode. So it's a very, very expensive production. But they can, it's Disney, so they can afford to do that. Um, I think I've <clears throat> released everyone from Yeah, everyone can unmute themselves if they have a, a question as well. If you want to be a, a game designer for the improv, you need to have, uh, it's a master's level. So we would expect someone that wanted to join the improv, I believe, to have uh, a relevant undergraduate degree and that creative part, <coughs> pardon me. So yes, there are people in the improv that are artists, there are people in the improv that are game designers and programmers. We, the improv teams are comprised of everyone across all the disciplines required to make games. So yes, the improv is suitable for designers and artists and programmers. Um, yeah, that's a good question there to follow up. The, I didn't explain actually at the time. The reason for the stage to look like that and why that's useful is that it also provides perfect lighting on the actors. So it isn't just something that appears behind the actors. The light from the scene affects the actors so that you can have these environments. They will look absolutely perfect without the cost of traveling to a set or to a remote location. And if you need to change something in this background because it's a video game set, you can do that very, very quickly. So the flexibility and the time taken to affect a change is very, very fast and it looks 100% real. So it's actually less immersive for the actors because the technology used for virtual production 
means that the video wall is rendering the background only for the camera's perspective. So for the actors, it actually won't look correct. But for the filmmakers, it gives uh, a lot better uh, results. And it means that hopefully you are not doing as much post-production. So you're filming what is, you could be filming things that ordinarily you would be doing in post-production. In a single step, the camera is capturing what it needs and you can be almost finished right away. It's definitely more immersive than a green screen because with a green screen, the artist, the, the actor, sorry, has nothing to react to, has no one to, um, absolutely no cues about where they are, but at least with this approach, they do have uh, more immersion. Uh, yeah. Um, I'll talk about the um, the career prospect of working in uh, VR. Is that first question? Um, right now, we have a lot of there's a lot of studios that are operating in the VR space. We have two or three studios even in our own city that are working in VR. I, I would say that. Coming from our courses, if you've learned game te games technology or games art or whatnot, there is no difference between working in VR, AR, computer games. The, the common thread of skill, of uh, experience that we introduce in our courses applies to all these areas. So it's really about your personal preference. If you're interested in VR, you can work in VR. If you're interested in, in making theme park rides, you can work in theme park rides. We have students from our courses that now work at Pixar making films because Pixar also use real time game technology as part of their filmmaking process. So it's really a technology and an industry that has grown outside of the influence of the games industry and now permeates all these things. So you can work in whatever discipline you find most interesting, be it virtual reality, augmented reality, games, uh, industrial use, uh, sort of serious use is a big application for VR and AR as well. Um, yes. Uh, we will make a video, this, uh, we're recording this session, so there will be a video replay available of the speech that we'll upload, I believe. I'm still recording. So the question and answer is also recording. Um, yes, we have a project in the past where we worked with 20th Century Fox. And this was in 2000, from 2010 to 2012. And we provided a tool for 20th Century Fox to use to create the second Planet of the Apes film. So it was the dawn of the Planet of the Apes. What it was, we provided a way for virtual camera technology to be used by the pre-visualization part of 20th Century Fox's pipeline using games technology. So the sort of game controllers, the, the PlayStation controllers with the, you know, the, light, the PlayStation Move, we had a controller like that, but it was very, very cheap and we allowed it to be used as a motion capture tool to move a virtual camera. Uh, for filmmaking. And pre-visualization is the part of the pipeline like storyboarding. So it's digital storyboarding. So actually, let me find a video for you guys because uh, although I realize that um, some people won't be able to view it, view it. is off your location. So I apologize for putting a YouTube video into chat because obviously I'm aware that is not necessarily. You'll be able to share your screen. 
just me. That's very true. Yes, yes, yes. That's a good idea, Alina. I forget I can do that. Yeah. Um, hang on a second. Let me just sort it out. Sorry, I'm struggling with this share screen. Okay, so here's an example of uh, what we did with uh, 20th Century Fox. So you can all see this. This is uh, essentially the storyboarding of a movie before it goes into production. And this is all done inside a game engine. And it's all done, uh, this is 2011, I think this was made. So this is all done by a team of two or three or four people to work out how the film's going to look, how is it the shot's going to be composed, what sets need to be built, what actors need to be hired, or in this case, what motion capture needs to be done. So all this is animated um, in a game engine using game engine technology and game controller technology that we provided uh, in order to make it happen. So all these shots when there's a shaky camera, that's, that's our technology, our product being used. So, and this still is expensive. Uh, the budget for this process for a feature film is still something like um, three to eight million million dollars. This part of the process costs uh, due to time and technology development and that sort of thing. So this is an example of what was being done 12 years ago. Sorry, not 12 years ago, in 2012, 2011. Uh, using games technology. So now this has evolved over that time to do the type of things that we can see being done today. Stop sharing. So that's an example of what we did. And I'm sad to say that uh, we, we didn't even get mentioned in the credits for the movie. So that wasn't brilliant, but uh, it was still a very interesting project to work on. And it was great for us to be able to work with professionals in that industry. So pro providing the technology is as easy for us as engineers to create technology, to, to work out technological problems. But it, unless you can take that and give it to someone who's actually going to apply it, um, it's a very different use. And when we started to work with them and people wanted to use it, they had different expectations. Someone that is a professional camera operator has expectations about what this thing needs to do, how it needs to behave, what controls they need to have. And so this is why we try to engage with external companies as much as we can, because it teaches us about those industries. Um, differences between design of normal games and VR games, yes. There is a tremendous difference because the experience will be fundamentally different. Um, that needs some explanation. First of all, if you've played a game, if you've played a, like a first person shooter game of any description, the, the world has to be a certain scale to look and feel correct for the player, that is different in VR because the scale has to be exactly the same as the real world because how we perceive the world is much closer to the real world. So we have to be very uh, careful about that. Secondly, the, the, the entire game design will be different because it's reliant upon the your interaction in VR with the game world. So how do you move? How do you pick up things? How do you achieve gameplay? Is all different in VR because, again, we're still discovering these rules, these systems for how to, how to do things in VR are not established. In first person shooters or normal video games, we have been using these rules for 30 years. So we know how to make things look right and feel right and be fun. But in VR, we're still discovering them. So it will be a fundamentally different process to design a game in VR. So it's a difference in spatial design, uh, a difference in interaction design. Uh, artistically, 
and technologically the difference isn't so bad. Um, so we have some more performance considerations in VR, but again, these are known things. So technologically, the difference is not great between VR and normal games. Artistically, the difference is not great, but in terms of game design, uh, that is very different. Uh, more VR and AR things. Uh, I'm trying to think of, uh, again, it's difficult to think of um, good examples because you know, I would like to show you the best example, but what we have is, you know, some very, there's very good ones out there, but there are, I'll, I'll try and find one I know that won't, um, again, it's difficult to show games as well because I don't want to show anything potentially controversial. find a good one though, I've got a good one in mind. Yes, so here's a good one. Um, I'll answer this question quickly. What's the ratio between lectures and game production and improv? I believe in the improv, it is mostly game production. I think it's two thirds to one third. But correct me if I'm wrong on that, um, Janice or um, Elaine. I think students can take one module per semester of content from the regular degrees. So I think the rest of the time is spent um, in team game production. So let me show you, I'll, I'll tell you about an interesting problem in VR before I show you this video. In virtual reality, one of the big problems that we have is the player, how do we move the player in the game world? So if you're in a virtual reality situation, you want to be able to explore this world. But in the real world, you're limited to a physical space. You're in a room, there is only a certain amount of ways you can move before you start to bump into walls. So this is a problem. And the further problem is that when you start to move, um, I should have a game controller here somewhere, but when you start to give people a game controller in VR and have a joystick that moves you forward, people can start to feel sick. So as soon as you give people a way to move in VR that isn't walking with their own legs, they could start to feel unwell. So this is a big problem. And some games have a teleporter where you'll just kind of jump to a new location that works okay. But I'll show you a game now that solves this problem completely. So how can you move in VR in a way that works, that allows you to move through the world and the player doesn't feel sick? I'll share another video. So hopefully everyone can see that there. This is a game called Lone Echo. And what's interesting about this game, you probably can't hear the sound, it's irrelevant. Why this game is interesting and why it works is because it's in zero gravity. So in this game, the player moves by using their hands to grab objects and push themselves away from them in order to move through the game world. And it turns out this doesn't make people sick because it works for our brains somehow because it's not exactly like reality and because the player doesn't have to physically move in space, you can just stand still and push yourself and pull yourself through the game environment. It works. And the interaction model here is very, very, very good. So it looks great, it feels right, and it works. And again, this is something we didn't know beforehand, but it was discovered. And so now we have this as a way of doing things for certain game types. It works. So I'll just stop this screen sharing again. So that's an example there. Uh, improv and opportunities for to try some VR projects, of course, yes. Um, 
we have enough at VR equipment at the university to support a certain amount of teams to do VR projects. So yes, it's very common for our students to be able to do a VR project uh, on the MPROF. And it's very common for the students to be able to undertake VR or AR research as part of uh, undergraduate programs as well. So yes. Uh, yeah, so that game works very well. There's other examples like that. Like I said, the type of games that work very well are dr like driving games. If you wanted to make like a Formula One racing game in VR, and there are, these are perfect. These are absolutely perfect games. And if that's what the gamer wants to do, they're beautiful and perfect because you're sitting down holding a steering wheel in a game where you're sitting down holding a steering wheel. So everything matches and everything feels good. The other type of games that work well, as I said, were games where you're, if you're holding a gun and shooting, because everything matches again, uh, that works quite well for the player. Um, no, the, the, there are lots of problems in VR. So for games that have some kind of action element or exploration element, the problem is navigation. For problems, for games that are reliant on storytelling, the problem is that the player necessarily won't necessarily follow the story in a way that is best to tell the story. So if something is happening that's important to the player, and in a normal game, you can show a cutscene or you can, you know, you can take the player out of the game and give them information, you can give them part of the story. But in a VR game, when you do that, it feels bad to the player to suddenly be watching something disembodied when they should be part of what's going on. So there's lots of challenges in that thing. It's also difficult in games that if you, right now in VR, it's very difficult to spend a long time in that game experience in VR because of the discomfort you would get from wearing a headset for a long period, for standing up for a long period. So VR games tend to be shorter. VR games tend to, you know, want to give you the content in bite-sized chunks but a normal game a console game you could sit and play for hours and hours and um, without getting up so there's lots of challenges right now in vr pandemic aside one of the the best um uses of vr is what's known as um oh, what's the term for it um it's, it's vr that sort of like a VR arcade. So I've seen these things in malls and shopping centers where there's a VR experience, an on-site on, on -site VR, that gives you a short experience that does something very cool that people pay for. Uh, Site-based VR, that's what it's called. And they can do some interesting things like they can have props and things that you can touch and interact that match with the real world. You can do it with your friends there are these VR experiences where you have a team of friends and you, you know, can all fight aliens with these guns and it's, it's great fun. And so those type of things work very well as a premium VR experience, a short paid for experience. But for home VR, you're correct. The problem is space that you need to have to operate the VR. It, it is more expensive than having a games console because you need to have the VR headset, you need to have a console to support it. Um, and also there are potential shortcomings in what we can do right now in VR relative to what we'd do in a normal game to tell a story or to give a player an experience. People's expectations are very difficult as well. Uh, opinion on future of VR tourism. This is a very good point, and indeed, this is a this is a great application of VR, because the perfect example right now. If you can't go somewhere, then you can go there in virtual reality and see those sites and whatnot, and be in that place in a in a limited, but still 
uh, measurable way. So there is a great potential for that going forward. However, the problem is that right now there is not a great market for people who are willing to pay for that. So right now, people believe that if they're paying money for something, it should give them a lot more hours of experience than we can currently deliver. So an, an extreme example of VR tourism was um, there was a game released in VR a few years ago where the user could climb Mount Everest. Yeah. So it was a, a short game. It was about one hour of total experience and it cost whatever, $10, $15, something like that. And it was brilliant. It was fantastic that people could go to Mount Everest and they could do some of the climbing, you know, in a limited way. And the culmination was they could stand on Mount Everest as the sun, sun went down and it looked 100% real, it looked perfect. But people were dissatisfied with it because being gamers, that they were market, it was marketed towards gamers, only gamers were playing it. Their expectation was if they were paying 15 pounds for a game, it should be more than one hour. There should be more to do, there should be more fun. And the idea that they were never going to get to go to Mount Everest or to climb it or to stand on the summit and that they were able to do that it was lost on them. So I think that VR tourism will be a very big thing, but VR technology needs to permeate more than just hardcore gamers, which is what we have just now. It's another problem with the market is that the people enjoying VR are people that are gamers, that have certain expectations about how games work, what they want to do, and that sort of thing. So there will be a gradual transition towards VR being applied and being seen to be used by people that are not just interested in playing games. It is very, very interesting, Matt. Uh, very interesting talk as well. And I'm also glad to see there's so many questions coming mm -hmm. from very enthusiastic uh, potential students. Uh, um, yes. So I wonder whether there are any more further questions Yes, please, please ask anything. It can be technical or creative. There's no, there's no such thing as a, a wrong question. Or a, 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 there's only wrong answers. <laughs> okay, if there are no more questions, um, we will have a recording of this and we will send over to uh, everybody who has registered. And also, if you want to get in touch with us uh, for any further questions, you can send us an email at international.ac.uk. At I've just put out on the chat. So it's international at apartheid.ac.uk. Um, if you missed the QR code to follow us on WeChat or Instagram, um, you can also uh, send it as an email and we will, we will send, send you the link to join as well. Um, so if there are no further questions, we will close this session. Um, we will have other sessions in the future so if you have already registered, we will send you uh, updates in the talks, um, for the talks in the future. Thank you everyone for joining today. Thanks very much. Thank you guys. I hope to see some of you here at Aberté in the future. Thank you. Goodbye.